let's join our voices and our hands, maybe. Those are some instruments too musical. And let's sing together. Bless that wonderful name. <clears throat>
We're doing things slightly different today, trying a few new things, and we've got some new faces with us. Brittany's back singing uh, today with us, and we're certainly glad to have her uh, singing the group and everything. And then we've got a, a newcomer, her and her husband, it's my understanding, has been uh, visiting here for a few weeks, Ms. Rachel Pace. And uh, I think you're going to, if, if, if uh, we get to see them coming in some more, I think we're going to be seeing more of this, this, this couple because uh, I'm gathering and learning as I get to know them that they're quite talented. So uh, this, is, this is great. Um, would you stand with us and let's sing together. Oh God, our help in ages past. <clears throat> Father, for this uh, worship service, Lord, thank you for the great music we had, Lord. I just pray now that uh, be with Gary as he brings the message, Lord, that uh, there may be the day that somebody comes to know you and 
devote their life to you, Lord. Just thank you for all the blessings we have. Thank you for the heat. Thank you for the warm houses. And just thank you for you. And Lord, just help us use this uh, offering to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. clients this week she was in the chair she goes to a church in Morganton and um, she's uh, she's probably in her middle 60s and I always ask people I said um, what tell me about your church tell me about your worship service and uh, pretty much what they do at their church we pretty much do here we, we do a lot of singing and, and that's what she said she said oh we sing and then we sing and then we sing some more and we sing a lot and I said, uh, but the, pa the pastor gets to preach, right? And she said, oh yeah, finally when we're done singing. <laughs> and um, I said, uh, so do you like the music? And she said, oh no. She, she said, uh, we do way too much of those repetition songs. And I said, well, uh, tell you what. I said, uh, you might want to think about something sometime. When you're in worship, you know, you're, you're attending your church. And you think about those songs that uh, repeat themselves. Uh, not all the time, but a lot of the time. They're straight from Scripture. So the more you do something, the more you get to know it. And any time that we can take a song, especially when it has Scripture as a part of that, the body of the, those lyrics, uh, we're just putting Scripture in, in, our, in our minds and in our hearts. And you know, the Bible, it, it instructs us to do just that. But she was complaining because of her feet and everything. Uh, you know, I don't like to do all that standing. So for this one, I'm going to let you sit down if you want to. But if you feel like standing and you want to sing this in Christ alone, you know, when it gets to the section that says, On Christ the solid rock, I stand. No, all other ground is sinking sand. That gets me excited. I just have to stand up and, and sing. So uh, do what you want to do. If you feel retired, don't feel bad about sitting down. But if you want to stand up and sing this, you go right ahead too. And here's your cue if you want to sing it. <laughs> Oh, 
that you stand for all through Scripture. You are our rock. You are our cornerstone. We would be nothing without you, Lord. We would have no power. We wouldn't have our sins forgiven. We wouldn't even be able to love our fellow humans except for the power through your Holy Spirit that you uh, minister to us as, as your people. Lord, I just ask that you uh, let that anointing from the Holy Spirit, that special anointing, fall on our pastor, Lord, and just uh, give him the courage and, and the strength and, and the words to say that would come in and, and, and fill our souls and fill our hearts with your love and your mercy and your wisdom and your knowledge. In Jesus' name, and the whole church said, Amen. Morning. morning it's a great job guys I, I appreciate that a few weeks ago we talked about the fact that that God is working in in each one of our lives that he began the work as David said when you and I were in our respective mother's womb and that he'll continue that work until we face Jesus face to face in fact, the Apostle Paul tells us that God, part of what the Holy Spirit is doing in our life is to transform us into the very image of Christ. And that means that we're to become more and more like Jesus in all that we do. This morning, uh, I want to talk about how God does that, how he transforms us, how the Spirit of God helps us become more and more like Jesus. So I'm going to begin with a couple of truths. You'll find those in your uh, sermon notes. The first one is this. It's very simple, that God expects his children to grow. God's desire is that each of us grow or mature, if you want to put that there. But God expects us to, to grow, to mature, to become the people that he's created us to be. In 2 Peter 5, 18, we find these words. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we are to, to grow. Everything that God has grows, right? We're all growing. We're growing older. Some of us are growing wider. Some of us are not growing any taller. Well, some of us are growing taller, I guess. But, but we're always growing. Churches are to grow, and God's children are to grow in our understanding of Jesus, understanding of who God is, understanding of, of life and, and all that it brings. Here's the second point. There are different levels of maturity within the, by the kingdom of God. There are different levels of maturity within the kingdom of God. Paul writes to the church in Corinth, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as carnal as to babes in Christ. According to the New King James, New American Standard says it's fleshly people. And a carnal person is a person who is living by the desires of the flesh. We spent a whole Sunday talking about what that means to be the battle that goes on between the flesh and the spirit. But what it says, what amazes me about this passage is that Paul doesn't challenge these people's salvation. He challenges their level of maturity. He said, you're acting just like the world. You're living just like everybody around you. You're not living... As spiritual people who are empowered by the Spirit of God, but you're living as you used to live before you were saved. And so he, he doesn't challenge their salvation. He challenges their maturity. And so we have carnal Christians. Now, let me just say this up front. If you know someone's a carnal Christian, start praying for them. You don't want them to stay there at all. That's not a good place to be. You, it, there's, there's no evidence of fruit in their life. There's really no evidence that God's doing anything. They're the people who, who are never happy, never satisfied about anything. If you go back and look at the passage we did in Galatians, they're the ones that Paul described that are in the flesh. I'm not going to go over all that now, but, but just think about that. That is not a place that we want to be, okay? There are some people there, uh, but that's not where we want to be. Now, he talks about babes in Christ. 
And he had to talk to them as babes in Christ. And when I think of a babe in Christ, just think about the infants that we have. Think about those in the nursery and some in here with us. And what happens with a babe? Well, babes, are, are they can't do anything for themselves, right? We have to feed them. We have to change them. We have to carry them everywhere we want them to go. There's nothing that they can do. Well, we know that in the society that we live in, that there are now three generations that have never been to church. And so we're going to have people coming in as we reach out to this community. And as we reach it, we're going to have some people that have no idea what happens in a sanctuary on Sunday mornings. They don't know anything about it. They don't know anything about God. Some of them have not even heard of Jesus. And so we're going to have to teach them everything. Those are babes in Christ. Then when we get into the Gospel of John... I'm sorry, in, in the letter, first John, John's letter, he talks about the fact that there are three more levels. And I'm going to read this to you. He said, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his namesake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, little children, because you know the father. I've written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I've written to you, young men, because you are strong in the word of of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one so he gives us three more levels of maturity he talks about children now children as we know are they've matured from being babes we don't have to carry them everywhere they can do some things on their own sometimes they bathe themselves they brush their teeth they eat what we give them we still have to look over them though we still have to supervise them and there are people within the faith that are growing they're maturing but we still have to help them we have to guide them uh, that's what we're here. That's part of disciple making, right? Is we're teaching them how to pray. We're teaching them how to study the word of God. We're teaching them how to hear the voice of the spirit as he speaks to us. We're teaching them all kinds of things about life. Then he talks about those who are young men. And, and these are the guys that, that have, they're past the child age. And these are the guys that we see that are really on fire for God. They're young men and they're young women. And they're the guys that say, hey, let's go out and take this community. Hey, we got to be doing something. We can't just sit in the pew. That's not what we were made to do. We need to serve the Lord. We need to do it with gladness. We need to do it with joy. Hey, let's go storm the gates of hell because we're told that the gates can't prevail against us. And so they're excited. And they want to be on fire. And they want to do things for the kingdom of God. And we need those people in the church as well. And then we have what he calls the fathers. And the fathers are the mature believers who have walked with the Lord for a long time. And they've experienced his goodness. And they've understood what it means to be filled by the Spirit. And they know what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. And these are the guys that, that, that ultimately are leading, hopefully leading the church. And, and a lot of it has to do with maturity, of being with the Lord, of walking with him for a long time. And so they're the guys who come in and mentor these young men and help them understand when to attack and when to hold back and, and, and what we should do and, and as God leads us and directs us. And, and it's important that we have fathers. In fact, I talked to some guys the other day, part of this church, and I said, one of the things that I see happening here is that we have some men who've been here now for 10, 15 years, and they're maturing and they're moving into that role of a father of a leader, of a mature believer in Christ. We've had some great men in that, and we still have some great men that have walked with the Lord for a long time, and they're helping mentor these guys as we go to them and talk to them. But you've got to have the different levels within a church. And we need all these different levels, hopefully not so many carnal, okay? But we do need the other levels. We need to see those people and the children that were, and the work that we do in Awana is taking these children and helping nurture them so that when the Spirit of God speaks to them and calls them to salvation, they're ready. Now let's go to the third thing as we talk about growing and how God grows us. We've talked about this before, but number three is God's ways are not our ways. I think it's very important that we realize this and remember this that God most likely is not going to do things the way that you think he should do them in fact he's probably never going to do things exactly the way that we think he should do them the passage is Isaiah 55 8 9 for my thoughts are not your thoughts nor are your ways my ways declares the Lord for as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts we have to buy into this fact that God doesn't do things the way we think he should. 
you know. He really does it. He, he works in ways that sometimes are mysterious. He works in ways that we sometimes don't understand what he's doing. He works through all kinds of things to bring about his will and to bring about good. And so we have to, to understand this. We have to see that he doesn't always do things the way that we think that he should. And now that brings me to really the heart of this message, and that's number four. One of God's favorite and most effective ways of growing us is trials. One of God's favorite and most effective ways of growing us is trials. I want to look at a verse, and I told Sharon the, yesterday, I said, you know, this, and, and this sounds bad to say this, but I said, you know, in some ways, this is my least favorite verse in Scripture. Because here's what it says. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Count it joy. Rejoice in the fact that there's a storm coming. Or that you're in the middle of the storm. Or that it's a very difficult time. Now, I don't know about you guys, and I guess that's why I was so convicted about this verse. That's not my first response to trials. You know, when things get tough and difficult, my first response is, praise God, we're going through a trial. Anybody here do that? I mean, I'm serious. I mean, that, that's hard to do, you know, when I start thinking about that. Or, or I don't pray. I don't say, God, you know, I really want to see this church grow, and I really want to mature, and I really want to be the man you want me to be. Bring more trials to us. Anybody pray in that way? We don't do it. I'm not, I'm not saying we should either, okay? I'm just saying it's not natural for us to do this, and yet that's what Scripture says. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Peter picks up on this theme in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 8, and he, and he says the same thing, except he puts it a little more in terms of I can live with. He said, you know, don't be too distressed by the trials that you're going through because God has a purpose for them. And then we're told in Hebrews 5, 8, that although he was a son, he's talking about Jesus, he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. You see, Jesus was not exempt from this thing called trials. I want to go back to the, the James chapter 1, verse 2 passage for a minute. And I want to break this down. I want to look at what some of these words mean. First of all, let's take the word consider. It means to think, to believe, to regard as, to hold the view. And so I am to think that these trials should bring joy to my... I'm to regard that as an opportunity to experience joy. Does that sound strange to you? Do you see why I say that God's ways are not our ways? That is not... That is not what I think of bringing joy to our life. But remember what I've told you? That if my experience or if your experience isn't in line with Scripture, then what has to change? Not the Bible. But we do. But we do. We have to bring our thinking. We have to bring our, our life in, in line with the Word of God. And so there's a certain way that we're to look at trials, and not as something negative, but as something positive. And for most of us, that requires a transformation, or metamorphosis, as John was talking about what the youth are going to study, a transformation in our thinking. And Paul says in Romans, it takes a renewing of your mind. A renewing of your mind. Now let's talk about the word joy for a minute. Literally, it means a reason for gladness. So I am to consider or I am to regard these trials as a reason for gladness. Not a cause of distress. What about that? Anybody there yet? This sense of being overwhelmed, this amount of stress that we have, whatever the situation is, whatever the storm is, whatever the trial is that we're going through, it is to be a considerate joy. I don't think this can happen unless we're totally surrendered to the Holy Spirit. I'll be honest with you. And I think that's why this is part of this Holy Spirit. Now, the word trials, 
Listen to what it means. To try to learn the nature or character of something by submitting such to and through extensive training. To try to learn the nature or character of something. What do you think that something is? It's you and it's me. We're God's trying to show us the nature and the character of who we are, what he's building inside of us. And so he's bringing us through these difficult times to show us what we're made of. To show us that, that he's put in us everything that we need to live the life that he's called us to do. And so we're going to submit. He's going to bring us to extensive testing. He's going to try us. You know. He's going to see. If we... He's going to show us that we really do have what it takes to be who God's called us to be. But it's not easy. It's not easy. He never promised that it would be easy. Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered. I think you and I do the same thing. I think we learn obedience to Christ. I think we learn to live the life that God's called us to live. Oftentimes through the things that we've suffered. And so think of trials as, as God's training ground or, or maybe God's gym. I want to read a passage out of Isaiah now. That I think is a, again, affirms what, what I'm saying to you. Isaiah 43, but now thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel. So let me stop there for a minute. So God is speaking and he's identifying himself and he says, Hey, look, I want you to know, I'm the one who created you. Okay? So he's making clear that he's talking to his creation. He's the one that's created us. He's the one who formed Israel. He's the one who established the church. Okay? So he's talking to us just as much as he's talking to them. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. So the first thing that he says, do not fear. Usually when God says do not fear, it means there's something coming ahead that would normally scare us. Okay? I mean, usually when he says that, he's saying, get ready. <laughs> what I'm about to say is probably going to terrify you. But don't be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. Okay? For I've redeemed you. That means to buy back out of slavery. I've bought you back. And then he says, I've called you by name. He knows you. Each and every person here. He knows us, knows us intimately, knows everything there is about us. I have called you by name. You are mine. And so God claims us. He says, you belong to me. Okay, you belong to me. Now here we go. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched. Nor will the flame burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Now, does that not seem like trials? When you're going through the deep water and you can't touch the bottom, God says, I'm with you and you're not going to drown. When you go through the fire, when you go through those intense times of agony and sometimes suffering, I want you to know you're not going to get scorched. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you through those times. The Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Verse 4, you are precious in my sight. You are honored and I love you. Think about that. God says, I, this is the best way. I want you to know that I take you through these trials. I take you through these difficult times. I take you through these stressful times, these overwhelming times, because I love you and you're precious to me. And I can't just let you stay the way that you are. I just can't do that. I love you too much to leave you that way. And I know you well enough to know that if I don't take you through this, you're never going to grow. You're never going to mature. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not fear, for I am with you. Isn't it amazing? I had the opportunity to, to sit down with the... Uh, Youth Wednesday night and just be a part of their study. And they, uh, they're doing a study with Colt McCoy. He was the quarterback for Texas for the, the Longhorns in 2010 when they went against Alabama for the national championship. 
And, they, and he tells the story of what it was like when in the first half he got hit and his shoulder uh, just went out on him. And he couldn't play anymore. Now think about this guy. All of his life from Pop Warner all the way up to, to now, he's dreamed about this opportunity to play in a national championship game. And he said that he just felt like he knew exactly what Alabama's defense was going to do before they could do it. But he gets injured and he, and he can't play. He and his dad, during halftime, he tried to throw. And he said, I, could not, I had no idea where the ball was going. I couldn't do it. And then he said something that, that really, really amazed me. He said, the greatest lessons I've learned in my life came through disappointment. Any amens there? Amen. You been there? You know what that's like? We do, don't we? We do. We know what it's like to suffer. We know what it's like to be overwhelmed. We know what it's like to say, God, help we know what it's like to not know what to do. To have things out of our control when so terribly bad we want to control them. We know what that's like. And God says that's ordained so that I can show you who I am and what I'm about. Think about that. If we look at trials through the flesh, then we're going to become disappointed and disillusioned. But if we look at them through a mind transformed by the Holy Spirit, then we're going to see them for what they are, opportunities to build our faith, which leads to greater opportunities to serve God in his kingdom. And that brings me to the fifth point. God is always working to develop strong faith in his children. God is always working to develop strong faith in his children. Galatians 3.11. The righteous man, the righteous one, shall live by faith. James says, Consider all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Think about what he's saying there. It is through trials that character and great faith are forged. And Peter tells us that our faith is more precious than gold. And so God is in the process of developing in my heart, in your heart, this faith that can move mountains. This faith that trusts God no matter what's going on around us. He's wanting to do that. In Hebrews eleven six, 6, we're told, And without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. And so here's the, here's the bottom line. Trials are ordained by God to produce faith in us that results in praise and glory and honor as Jesus is revealed in our lives. I want to tell you a short story. I was talking to someone recently, and I said, you know, the, I've done a lot of things in my life. I worked in textiles at, for a short time. I worked in a lumber yard. I worked in furniture. I worked in county government, and I worked in state government. But what I do now is I still the hardest thing I've ever done. And if you've never had to preach sermon after sermon after sermon, 52 sermons, or so 50 sermons a week, and, I mean a month, and, or a year, get it right in a minute, see, and then, and then year after year, then you don't understand what it's like. But I, as I was working on this sermon, I just, I just really <laughs> wasn't happy with the way it was ending. In fact, I, I told someone recently, I said, you know, this kind of series is very, very difficult because if I'm talking about the flesh, and I know I'm going to do battle with the flesh that, that week. If I'm talking about Satan, then I know it's going to, th those efforts are going to intensify. And, and you have to understand that I'm not saying this for any reason other than it's true, but as a pastor and as a leader of a church that God is moving in, then I know that there's a bullseye on my front and back. 
I am a target, and my family is a target. And as you're growing, you become even a bigger target. That's just life. That's the way that it is. And we need to understand that. It's true. I don't say much about it because I'm not looking for sympathy or empathy or anything like that. I'm just saying today that I, sometimes you feel it more than you do other times. That's why prayer is so very important that we are surrounded in prayer. But as I was saying, I just didn't feel like this sermon... I felt like it's what it needed to be, but I just did not have an ending that I felt, this is really what God's saying to us. And so if I, if I don't have other things I have to do on Fridays, then I try to clean the house a little bit, get some stuff done so it's easier for us on weekends. And, and, and God speaks to me sometimes in the most unusual times and most unusual places. And I wasn't even thinking about this message Friday when, when and in fact, I was actually mopping the kitchen. And all of a sudden, I just decided I needed to, I pulled out a piece of paper because it just started pouring, and I believe it's from the Holy Spirit. But, and he knew that I wasn't, I didn't think we'd brought it home yet. I didn't think that we had nailed this to, that, that we can go out and say, okay, praise God, we can deal with trials. And so here's what I wrote down. When we learn to, to rejoice in trials, when we learn, I think we have to learn. I don't think it's something that comes natural. When we learn to rejoice in trials, then number one, we acknowledge in our heart that God is in control and is with us. And so we've got to get it from here down to here. You see, if I'm going to, if I'm going to rejoice in trials, if, if when difficult times come, our first tendency is going to be to, to sometimes panic or feel overwhelmed or, or feel, I have no idea what to do. But if I can say, but God, you're in control and you're doing this for my good. You're allowing me to go through this thing, whether it's at work, at home, with family, with children, with health, whatever it is. God, you're allowing me to go through this because you're building my faith. Because as you said in Isaiah, that you love me, I'm precious to you, you honor me. And so I need to, I need to trust you through this okay and so we begin to to allow God to be sovereign in our heart we begin to see that that God is 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 really not trying to hurt us and God it's not that he's gone to sleep or it's not that he's moved away from us but that he is drawing us closer to him during this period of time and so we we see that that in our heart that he's in control he's with us he's right in the middle of the storm he's he's breaking the waves so we can walk through it and so that's the first thing and when that happens then our countenance changes now what i mean by that is our whole demeanor. Everything about us begins to change. The stress that we're feeling, the sense of overwhelming, begins to just fade away. And the very peace of God begins to descend. And, and our attitude changes. And we go from being victims to victors. Now, I don't know about you, but I would much rather be a victor than a victim. No matter what's happening in my life, I would rather find the victory that Christ has already won in that than to feel, poor, poor, pitiful me. Look what I'm going through. You see? And so our attitude changes because God is in control, because God loves you, because God is with you, because God believes in you, because God is taking you through this to make you stronger. Then your attitude changes about the trial. Why? Because God's in control of it. Who's going to control that trial? God, right? I'm certainly not going to control it, you know, but God is. And so when that happens, then here's number three. We free the Holy Spirit to do his thing. We free the Holy Spirit. Now think about what that means. We free the Holy Spirit to just unleash his power in our lives. You see, the Holy Spirit is then free to begin to Make us those victors that we believe that we are. He's free to fill us with the, the very love of God, knowing that God is with us, that God is for us, that God believes in us. He's given us self-control. And when that happens, we rejoice. And we find that this verse is not so crazy. That James was not out of his mind when he wrote this. But that when we surrender ourselves totally to the will of God, whatever comes, the Spirit of God produces in us what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. He does all those things in our life when we yield to Him. No matter what we're going through. No matter what we're going through. And so, 
when I wrote this ending down, then I started worshiping God. Because you cannot help but worship God when you free the Holy Spirit in your heart to do what He wants to do. And so I, I was listening to Pandora on the, I like the Chris Tomlin section. I had his own, and they're playing all this stuff. And all of a sudden, I mean, this is, it's amazing how God does this. And all of a sudden, Matt Redmond's 10,000 Reasons came on. 10,000 reasons to praise God. 10,000 reasons to bless God. 10,000 reasons, and more, and more. And so I, I got on my laptop, and I sent Eddie and Eddie a, an email, and I said, look, guys, here's what's happened. And I want to change this invitation. I want you to do this 10,000 reasons because I want to end this service not as a down service, but as a praise service. As a service in which we worship Almighty God, who no matter what we're going through, is able because there is nothing impossible with him. No matter what you're hap what's happening in your life, no matter whether it's financial or whether it's relational or whether it's you're looking for a job and haven't found one, no matter what it is, God is in control. And so we're going to worship him. We're going to praise him. We're going to thank him. Yeah, come on up, guys. We're going to get ready, and we're just going to say, God, I want to affirm in my heart right now that you're in control, that I am not going to let this, whatever the burden is, stress me out, that I am going to turn it over to you, and I'm going to believe, God, that you're going to do what only you can do. And you're going to make me a victor and not a victim. Guys. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that's within me. Bless His holy name. And what Gary said, 10,000 reasons, there is much, much more than that. There's many, many more ways that we bless the Lord. Let's stand together and let's bless His name. It's a new day dawning It's 
prayer. Father, we pray that you would teach us to bring our lives in line with your word. And when we encounter various trials, that we would learn to rejoice, knowing, God, that you're in control, that you're with us, that you're leading us, that your spirit is guiding us, that you're causing us to grow and become the, the men, the women, the boys, the girls that you want us to be, that we're going to walk with you in holiness, and that we're going to believe that you are a God that can do the impossible. And so the only way we can know that is if you bring us to impossible situations. Father, I pray now for anybody that's a part of this congregation this morning, anyone that's watching, that if they're going through an impossible situation, that today they would know that they're not alone. That you're leading, you're guiding, and you're building faith. And that ultimately, Christ has already won the victory through the cross. And so we praise him, we bless you, we thank you. We offer our love and our worship to you. In Jesus' name and for his sake. And all God's people said.